Good afternoon and welcome. To get us started today, I'm going to turn it over to Deidre Anderson for the Hingham Historical Society. Deidre. Thank you, Eileen. Welcome everyone to the final program of the third annual Hingham Historical Society lecture series, Benjamin Lincoln's World, Stories from Colonial Hingham to the Early Republic. My name is Deirdre Anderson and I serve as the executive director of the Hingham Historical Society. It's only fitting that I greet you all as board president Paula Bagger and I did in September at the start of this series from the Benjamin Lincoln House. We've gathered most months since September online, and we are humbled by your loyal support of this series in a pandemic year. In the time since we first gathered, we have officially closed on the purchase of the Lincoln Home and are now methodically archiving its contents in anticipation of interpreting the home and opening it as a public historic site. In the next couple of weeks, each of you will receive our report of giving, the most formal the society has undertaken. And we do so in an effort to memorialize the generous donations that made our campaign for the Lincoln House possible, as well as the philanthropic gifts to the society through our Hingham History Fund and gifts in honor of or memory of loved ones. As many of you know, it is through membership and philanthropic giving that our work is made possible. If you've enjoyed this series, we thank you in advance for including us in your future charitable plans and for your encouragement of friends and neighbors to join as members of the Hingham Historical Society. There is no better time because as many of you might have heard or seen, we are in the midst of Springham, which I think Benjamin Lincoln and his family would have enjoyed. It's a series of outdoor concerts at the Hingham Heritage Museum. And we have two more weekends, next Saturday from 2 to 5 p.m. and Memorial Day weekend from 2 to 5 p.m. We'll be gathering outdoors for some music and community after a long year. And as you anticipate summer visitors, we have discounted tickets for members to our popular walking tours and access to the Hingham Heritage Museum, where we currently feature on exhibition the artwork of Beatrice Baxter and Louis Ryle in a show called Picturing Hingham. And of course, members enjoy early ticketing access to next year's lecture series. In wrapping up, I want to give sincere thanks to all of our le volunteer lecturers this past year, David Mattern and Andy Hoy, Richie Garrison, Wayne Eckerson, Andy Hertig, Russ Heisner, Michelle Marchetti Coughlin, and today's lecturer, Sally Snowman. I also want to thank our education committee who have done an incredible job of making this series possible, led by Eileen McIntyre and Elizabeth Danis, and joined with Ruth Gilbert Whitner, Andy Hertig, Marianne Bryan, Kathy Curley, Lara Thompson, and Anne McCarthy Egan. Without your incredible work and de volunteer dedication, none of this great community and enrichment would have been possible. So sincere thanks, and I'll turn it back to Eileen. Hello. All right. So thank you so much, Deidre, and what a year we've had together. Thank you all in the audience for being with us once again today. Um, and on behalf of the Board of Directors and the Education Committee, welcome to our final program in the Benjamin Lincoln's World series. Our host today is Ruth Gilbert Whitner, who will cover the first portion of the program, including the role that Hingham's Major General Benjamin Lincoln played in overseeing lighthouses off New England's coastline. Ruth will then introduce our guest speaker. Ruth is a member of the Society's Education Committee, which benefits enormously from her professional experience. Ruth's almost 50 years in the educational field includes roles as a volunteer, a teacher, a consultant, and a school administrator in Pennsylvania, Maryland, Virginia, Connecticut, and Massachusetts. Ruth received her doctorate in educational leadership from UMass Lowell. In 2018, she retired after serving as superintendent of the Whitman Hanson Regional School District. 
Ruth's retirement, though, has simply opened the door to a new phase of her career in education. She currently coaches beginning superintendents with the Massachusetts Association of School Superintendents and the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, facilitates st strategic planning for school districts, and chairs high school accreditation reviews with the New England Association of Schools and Colleges. It is my great pleasure to turn today's program over to Dr. Ruth Gilbert Whitner. Ruth. Welcome to the final program of the Hingham Historical Society's 2020-2021 lecture series, Benjamin Lincoln's World. Today's program is Boston Light and 18th Century Lighthouses. Located on Little Brewster Island in Boston Harbor, Boston Light was first lit on September 14, 1716. Following my introduction, Sally Snowman the 70th and first female keeper of Boston Light will provide a historical perspective of Boston Light, the country's oldest continually used lighthouse. Throughout this lecture series, we've learned a lot about Benjamin Lincoln, especially his strong leadership throughout the Revolutionary War. In Trumbull's painting, 1826, which hangs in the US Capitol building, we see Major General Benjamin Lincoln mounted on a white horse, extending his right hand to the surrendering British officer. Following the war, Benjamin Lincoln's contributions to the Republic continued for nearly 30 years. In the 10 years following the war, he served Massachusetts and the nation as Secretary of War, president and founding member of the Society of Cincinnati and Lieutenant Governor of Massachusetts. He was instrumental in supporting the writing of the US Constitution as a Hingham delegate, the suppression of Shays Rebellion in Western Massachusetts and the negotiating of treaties with the Creek Indians and the Indians in the Ohio Valley. In 1789, George Washington appointed him collector of the Port of Boston a position he held for nearly 20 years. His position as collector expanded considerably with his appointment in 1790 by George Washington as superintendent of lighthouse, beacons, buoys, and public piers. In a lengthy letter to Benjamin Lincoln, dated March 10th, Secretary of the Treasury Alexander Hamilton wrote, I am now to inform you that the President of the United States has been pleased to commit you to the general superintendents of the establishments of the nature mentioned in the said act, which are within the state of Massachusetts and to appoint for the special care of each. The act referred to in the letter was the declaration by Congress on August 7th, 1789, specifying that the Department of the Treasury was now responsible for the funding of the country's lighthouses as well as other aids of navigation. In 1790, 13 lighthouses were ceded to the US government. In Hamilton's letter dated March 10th, he identified six lighthouses, five lighthouse keepers and their salaries. A salary of $400 per year in 2021 currency would have the purchasing power of $11,516.39. He appointed the keepers in their lighthouses, Boston Light, the keeper Thomas Knox, with a salary of $400 a year. And later on, you're going to meet Sally Snowman who is dressed as the keeper's wife and her name was Content Knox. Also Cape Ann Lighthouse, Keeper Samuel Houston, also a salary of $400 per year. 
Plum Island, the keeper was Abner Lowell. And you notice there's a P on Plum, which is not the way we spell it today, but it's the way Alexander Hamilton spelled it. His salary was $220 per year. Nantucket, the keeper was Paul Pinkham. The Nantucket lighthouses were still being ceded to the government at that time, so no salary was listed. Plymouth Light, which is also, also known as Gurnet Light to those of us here in New England. And um, Alexander Hamilton wrote it was the widow of the late General Warren, who was the keeper, but that was actually an error. It was the widow of General John Thomas. And that was $240 per year uh, was their salary. And Portland Light was still under construction. This is a copy of Benjamin Lincoln's official appointment letter dated July 14th, 1790. Uh, please note in the letter that the name of the keeper at Gurnet or Plymouth Light had been corrected to John Thomas. And John Thomas was the son of General John Thomas, the keeper who had been there. And his son actually stayed as keeper until 1812. Throughout his lifetime, Benjamin Lincoln exemplified the diligence and commitment of a dedicated public servant. The nearly 20 years he served as lighthouse superintendent of Massachusetts were no exception. He visited lighthouses, advocated for lighthouse keepers, and made numerous suggestions about the location, construction, maintenance, and upkeep of lighthouses. His experiences at Seguin Light, located two miles south of the Kennebec River in Maine, which was then part of Massachusetts, offer an example of General Lincoln's thoughtful attention to the needs of lighthouses and their keepers. The first keeper of Seguin Light, which was constructed in 1795, was Major John Polerski, who had fought in the Revolutionary War. Major Polerski soon found the steep, rocky island to be nearly uninhabitable. In 1790, he wrote a letter of bitter complaint to Benjamin Lincoln, which described in detail the financial and physical hardships he was experiencing. He began the letter. You know, dear general, all the difficulties and expenses a lighted Seguin is attended to. And I don't want to have extravagant wages, but I would like to save myself. After receiving the letter, General Lincoln advocating for Major Polerski contacted the Commissioner of Revenue, his superior, but met with no success. Life did not get better at Seguin Light Island. And by 1800, the house at Seguin Light was rotting and the bridge to the landing beach had deteriorated badly. Benjamin Lincoln traveled to Seguin Light to assess the situation. He had no confidence in the structure and its collapsing timbers. And given his portly stature stated, the access is difficult for me. Following the visit, he authorized minor repairs. Despite Benjamin Lincoln's efforts to assist, life at Seguin worsened. After an especially brutal storm, Major Polerski and his helper were marooned on the island for many, many months. During Benjamin Lincoln's tenure as lighthouse superintendent, additional lighthouses were built in Massachusetts and Maine, increasing in number from six to 20. The general responded to the recommendations of the Boston Marine Society to construct more lighthouses. In Truro, General Lincoln selected the site for Cape Cod, also called Highland Light, 10 acres of land purchased from Isaac Small for $110. General Lincoln then hired his brother, Theodore Lincoln, to build the lighthouse. Some expressed concerns about a conflict of interest. However, the general's long history of integrity prevailed and the commissioner of revenue approved the hire. Each lighthouse presented its own challenges. Some burned down, others were destroyed by violent storms and the lighthouse keepers lives were often often in danger and were very, very difficult. Superintendent Benjamin Lincoln's responsibilities included lighthouses on the coast of Maine with seven lighthouses being built during his time in office. Portland Light, completed in 1791, presented the general with numerous headaches. 
Upon completion, it was determined that the view from the tower was blocked by headlands. Following approval from Alexander Hamilton, additional height was added, which resulted in an area too small for the lighthouse lantern. The appointment of the lighthouse keeper became quite political. And after a few years, the tower became damp and uninhabitable. While Benjamin Lincoln offered remedies that included a good coat of quote, well-painted shingles, it is unlikely that his suggestions were implemented. In 1809, Benjamin Lincoln resigned his post as collector of the Port of Boston, retired from public life and returned to Hingham. He died at the age of 77 on May 9th, 1810, after a lifetime of dedicated service to his country, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and the citizens of Hingham. The lighthouses under Benjamin Lincoln's supervision have been rebuilt, redesigned and automated. Today, there are 89 lighthouses in Maine and Massachusetts. My father loved the Atlantic coast and its lighthouses. I am fortunate to have a handwritten paper he wrote and presented about Mid-Atlantic and New England lighthouses over 60 years ago. In preparing this presentation, I reread his paper and was delighted to find mention of Benjamin Lincoln and the story of Major Polerski and Seguin Light. In learning about Benjamin Lincoln and his responsibilities for lighthouses, I used online and print resources. An excellent resource is the book Lighthouses of New England by New England marine historian Edward Rowe Snow, who lived from 1902 to, to 1982. Originally published in 1945, the book was updated in 2002 by Jared, Jeremy de Etremont, the president and historian for the American Lighthouse Foundation. His book, Lighthouse Handbook New England, is also a valuable resource of information. It is now my distinct pleasure to turn this over to Sally Snowman, the 70th Lighthouse Keeper of Boston Light. All right, so um, as was mentioned, I was introduced as the Keeper of Boston Light. Uh, it has its 305th anniversary this year, first established light station in Colonial America. And I am honored to have been the Keeper now for 18 years. Um, and up until just a couple of years ago, I resided on the island seasonally for about five and a half months out of the year. And that story will unfold as we go. And we will be getting into our, um, the PowerPoint presentation, which you're looking at now is what the island looks like in the 21st century. We have a various number of buildings on the island. They're labeled and with the dates that they were established. At the top of the tower, you'll see the light that for an ill lens that's there came over in 1859 and continues to be used today. We will also talk about that. In 1716, it was the first light station in colonial America. And then in 1719, a fog signal station. One of the things that's interesting is that many people that are not into the Maritimes, not even aware that we have fog signals unless they live by the ocean or Great Lakes, wherever they may have a fog signal. And so that's our claim to fame, not just being a light station, but also a fog signal station. We're looking at a map entrance into Boston Harbor. In Little Booster Island, if you see my cursor, there's a little yellow light around that. And imagine in the, during the 1600s, when the provincial government of, of the British government was colonizing the Boston area. They had crossed 3,000 miles across the Atlantic Ocean, and then they'd need to take a hard right rudder into Boston Harbor. If you look where Little Booster Island is, you'll see some green shaded islands. And then if you move down, we have the town of Hull, with the elbow, it's a gray area. 
there's only one nautical mile between Hull and what we call the Brewster Islands. Many ships during those first hundred years or so coming across, making that turn into Boston, didn't make it. They followed on the, the rocks and ledges of, in the upper right-hand corner of this map. So the ships would crack open like a like a egg, and the cargo, the people, and most of the time the ships would also be lost. If they missed the turn and headed and landed in the town of Hull, what was there was a sandy beach with some rubble stones um, along where we call the elbow in area. And many times when those ships fouled, the cargo could be retrieved, the people, and many times the ship as well. So as the provincial government was thinking about, we need a lighthouse, where are we going to put it? What are our best choices? Little Brewster Island won out. And if you notice, there's some rocks to the right of that, of the island as well. However, Boston Light sits right in the channel of what we call Nantasket Roads. So you always wanted to keep Boston Light to your right. The red dotted line is where they traversed into the inner harbor. And notice we have some green islands with its sort of zigs and then zags. Well, that had some uh, shipwrecks as well. However, one of the things that changed the way that we came into the harbor is with larger ships and the invention of the combustion engine. And what happened then is the ships were getting too big and um, too challenging to continue coming through the narrows. If you find on the map where it says Massachusetts Bay, there were two channels dredged here starting somewhere around 1870 and it finished in the early 1930s. So we now have what we call the North Channel and the South Channel coming into President Roads, then picking up the red dotted line into Boston. So when Boston Light was lit in 1716, it only had candles, so regular table candles. There were 14 of them on a chandelier. And people say, well, how could the ships actually see that as they come in? Well, imagine how pitch black it was here when we had no city lights, no street lights, what have you. Seeing that light on the horizon was enough to beckon them, come this way, and knowing to keep it to starboard or to the right as they came into the harbor. What did Boston Light look when it was first established? We really don't know. All we know is by sketches and etchings of what it may have looked like. And this particular ship that we see here, this was the from the, it was the provisional governments from Britain that were, oversaw the commerce coming in and out of the harbor and is anchored off Boston Light. And if we look at Boston Light and we'll see there's a tree there and um, a single tower. We question the, um, the trees on it. <laughs> It's a ledge out there, very rocky, and suspect that the trees would have been um, cut down early in the game and building the structure for the keeper and his family. The next rendition that we have is this one called the North Prospect by Captain Cyprin Southack. And it was an etching that he did. And once again, <coughs> we see that trees were added to the, um, the landscape. What is um, similar is the onto the left, that's the west end of the island where the dock and the pier is, and that is there. And then to the right was the, the ledge part where the lighthouse stands. So then we get into our fog signal station story. How did this come to be? Well, the first keeper was George Worthy Lurk, and he came out here with his family and a slave. And occasionally he would go into Boston to get his pay. And on one particular day that he was headed into Boston in November with his wife, his daughter, his slave, went into Boston and came back 
with a friend named John. And on the island was left another daughter and a friend. And as the rowboat was coming to Little Booster Island to land, it turned over and all five of them drowned, being witnessed by the daughter and the friend. So that was two years into Worthy Lex's duty. They hired an interim keeper to come out. Within three days, he had perished as well. The third keeper that came out, he had better luck. And his was, whoops, sorry. Um, and he uh, brought with him, or uh, went to the government to request a great cannon to answer ships in the fog. Him being a ship captain and had sailed ships for many, many years, he was very much aware of signals that the ships would sound to ascertain if there were another one in the area in limited visibility, such as fog or sleet, heavy snow, things like that. And what would happen is a ship would take a gun and with black powder fire it off and it would go boom boom. And then if they heard no baboons back, they'd make the assumption that there were no other ships that they would run into at sea. If they heard a louder one, like a baboon, they would say, okay, they're a far distance, we'll monitor this. If they heard a baboon, they'd say, we need to change our course, drop sail, do something to prevent a collision. So here we had um, John Hayes on Little Brewster Island listening to these ships. And because they were following on the Brewsters and the ledges, he requested a great gun to answer ships in the fog. And this is the cannon that was given to Boston Light in 1719. It was what we would call a shot out cannon. If they continued to use it as a weapon, it would blow up and horribly kill or harm the people that were firing it off. And so this was just the, the boom sound. Now as ships, more ships were coming, they were getting bigger, they were getting faster. To just be listening to a ship and answering back, they did it more frequently. So in the limited visibility, they would fire it off, let's say once an hour. And then once ships even got faster, maybe every 30 minutes. And at this time, it was just a family life station. So the question I have in my head, how old was a child to be taught how to fire off the black powder? Because if you were doing this for 24 hours for many days, for one person to be doing that um, would not have been safe into itself. And then we had the Revolutionary War. In 1776, the British blew up the tower on the way out of Dodge, where they left Boston. And it had been thought for many years, a uh, long time, that the tower that stands there at Boston Light today was a totally new one. So Boston Light is not considered the oldest standing tower in the country. That goes to Sandy Hook down in New Jersey. That was established in 17... 64, and um, the British fired upon it, but they didn't blow it up. So that original tower is still standing down in New Jersey. But Boston Light was assumed to have been totally blown up and totally rebuilt. We had a restoration project out there in uh, 2014, and lo and behold, guess what they found? The first nine to 14 feet are the original. If you look at this, um, on your screen, you'll see in the lower part of the tower, the, the granite stones are irregular in size. As they move up the tower, you'll see that they're more regular. And therefore, the way that they reconstructed it, they had better tools to do it then. And so the, from 14 feet up is the new tower. So it was exciting to be out on the island with the contractors to have verification of this. So here's the picture. And uh, so it's 1783 is from the 14 feet above is the new tower. In 1830 is the next rendition that we have of the tower. Once again, we don't know how accurate it is other than the trees are gone. And we know that it's accurate in the sense that we have some um, 
heavy big stones to the left of the tower. Those are still there today with the little crevice between the stone and the island itself. And the fishermen that's sitting in the forefront, the, the two items that were shipped, exported from the colony from the early times was trees and codfish. So we give tribute to this fisherman here representing the codfish exports in our in the colonial days. That cannon that we saw earlier that was first used in 1719 continued into 1851. And it was replaced by a fog signal bell that was in place for about 20 years. This is not the bell. This is on the island now with an artifact. We don't know where the original bell was. This one here was in Boston Harbor. We just don't know whereabouts. It helped tell us our story. And to this day, we remain a fog signal station. And um, it gives one prolonged blast of beep every 30 seconds. And the way that that gets activated when we jump into the technology of the 21st century, the mariner does that by their marine radio. They can go on a frequency uh, and click the microphone on the radio five or consecutive more times and it will activate the fog signal that will remain for about 20 to 40 minutes. And then we have our lantern at the top of the tower. Back in 1716, it was 14 candles in a chandelier or candelabra as they called it. The lens that's in this photo here that was brought out here in 1859. And um, I just noticed the date is wrong. It says 1958. <laughs> <laughs> typo. Uh, it's a typo. And it took a year to raise the lantern room, this big lantern room right here, 14 feet. The part that's bricked in right here, that was the original lantern room prior to this nine foot crystal being brought over from France with 336 individual prisms. And when it came over and activated in 1859, it was done by a clockworks where there was a long chain with a weight on it and it would get wound up every four to six hours that would rotate to have it do the flash every 10 seconds. It is now electrified. And we have our first photograph of Little Brewster Island dated 1875. And you notice all the buildings that are on there. And and what their functions were. If you go to the far right up at the hill, you'll see something that looks like a cannon. And that's because it is. That's where the fog signal uh, cannon was sat, but it wasn't still used in 1875. We had a bell for 20 years. And then with the invention of the, the engine, we had steam fired fog signals out there. So it was just sitting out there as an artifact at this time. If you see the things laying down on the ground, that was laundry. It's very windy out on Little Brewster Island. It's very small. It's, well, back in these days, I think there's been more erosion. Right now, it's an acre and a half at high tide and three acres at low tide. So at high tide, it's equivalent to a, a football field. And so if they were drying clothes on a windy day, they would end up in the ocean. Placing them on the ground did two things. It dried them, but the, the, the white color, it also bleached them out. You almost can see on the ground this little white house that might look like a dog house. One of the things that the island needed for a steam fired fog signal is water and to bring uh, fresh water to the island was uh, a difficult act to do. And so they had a cistern, and we'll get into that in a little bit. But they tried to find um, potable water on the island. 
and there's a piece of wood here, and there's another one over here. It was their efforts to find um, fresh water that they could use for the steam fired fog signal. And this is a close up of the house that we saw in the previous one. Notice the uh, connection between the keeper's house and the tower. At this time, it was uh, a family, there would be two families, the principal keeper and then an assistant keeper. They needed that second keeper when they started having the steam fired fog signals. They needed the extra people, especially when they had to maintain it during the night. If you notice to the right, there are two buildings and up top of one looks like a siren horn. Because they were so close to Boston and to uh, MIT, the Massachusetts Institute, Institute of Technology, they used to use Boston Light as a trial place for different kinds of fog signals as, weather, as well as apparatus for the light, uh, light apparatus. And that's why there's so many buildings here because they were tinkering with different kinds of machineries, different devices and the like. As you can see this little dog house uh, down in front here, which was an effort to find a um, uh, water. And then the house grew up. They raised the roof to make a third floor in 1859. And the front entrance into this duplex was right here. Where I know you can see the arrow. And they switched it so each of the sides of the house had their own entrances. Then this is a photo be taken between 1893 and 95 when MIT literally camped out on the island during the summer months, April to July, which is the foggiest times of the uh, seasons out there. And once again, if you look over to the far left, they've got some sort of um, device to experiment with their technology. We're assuming that in the forefront here, that looks like a, uh, a cabin type thing, that that might have been their dorm. And this is uh, what it looked like in circa 1935. And in 1939, things shifted. With the lighthouse service, or uh, in, the, in the manning of the lighthouse service from 1716 to 1939, were all civilian keepers. And a big change came when the US lighthouse service, and um, I switched the, the lighthouse stations and the US lighthouse services combined into what we now know as the US Coast Guard, which also absorbed the revenue service, which were the cutters that protected our shorelines. And this photo here is a civilian em, um, employee that had switched to military. So the person hanging from tether rope here is now a military personnel versus um, civilian. And we mentioned earlier, Edward O'Snell, what a phenomenal historian he is. And this is a, a photo of the times when he was playing Flying Santa. And for you that may have lived on the South Shore for many, many years, may have actually heard of Flying Santa. And Edward O. Snow took his first flight here in the Boston area, delivering gifts to the lighthouses back in 1939. And to this day, the tradition holds through the, um, there's a not-for-profit called the Friends of Flying Santa. So here is Edward O. Snow with his um, Santa beard and hat on, dropping the gift, which is right here, if you can see the cursor and the yellow circle, being dropped onto the beach. And Edward O. Snow did this until 1980, when his health no longer allowed him to continue for a bit, the Hull Life Saving Museum took on that task. It got too much to have two not-for-profits out of the um, Hull Life Saving Museum. And that was when the Friends of Flying Santa established themselves. 
And it's a great a photo of the island of what it looked like in 1940 and how close it was to what we call Great Brewster Island. The two islands are connected at, at low tide. And when we look back at the history of the 1600s and 1700s, it was uh, Little Brewster Island was also referred to as the head of Great Brewster Island because it sticks out like a head. And here is um, the keeper. Uh, in 1957, fetching the gift from Flying Santa down at the beach. And in the background, you can see two people. At one time in the late 30s and early 40s, there were three families living on the island. The principal keeper, two assistant keeper, and a total of um, the, um, 18. Yeah, 18 kids. Uh, it was just amazing. <clears throat> and this is what the island looked like in 1947. And now we're going to be looking at how the light works at the top of the tower. And this is a, a recent picture. It was actually one that I got to take. I had a helicopter ride in the um, flying Santa helicopter and took this photo. And this is what we have on the island today. The keeper's house is um, headed west toward Boston, which is toward the top of the screen. And if you see some uh, iron posts coming out of the water just past the keeper's house, we're going to be talking about tours out to Boston Light by the Park Service. And the Park Service invested money to have a safe landing so tours could be brought out. The Park Service actually built a, a seasonal pier out there. Over in the, um, over to the right, we have a building with a huge wide roof. That's our cistern building. And then we have the tower to the left and at the top of the tower is the light. Entrance into the tower looks like this. And you walk into the, a small room that used to be the oil um, storage. storage area back in the earlier days and it's been turned into a small museum room. And then there's 76 spiral stairs that comes to a landing, which makes the 77th step, another ladder that goes into the gear room. The gear room is very small and it has this gear works that rotates that nine foot crystal. It's 4,000 pounds of glass and brass that turns, flashes every 10 seconds, 24 hours a day in our 21st century. To get into the lantern room is another ladder. And this is a view from the lantern room. I love this picture of the light because doesn't it look like an eye with eyelashes overlooking Boston Harbor, keeping it safe. And this is what it looks like if you're standing in the gear room and you're looking up into the prism, you're looking at 336 individual prisms. The lens was made out of over in France, shipped over here, arrived in 1858 and installed in 1859. And I don't know if you can notice this or not, there's a 1000 watt lamp where I'm circling the cursor here. And then there's another one on the right. That's the backup one. So when this one burns out, it's a lamp changer. It automatically switches so that this light on the right will turn on. This one uh, thousand watt lamp gets magnified to two million candle power through these prisms. As you notice those circles, and as the light rotates, it takes two minutes for it to rotate and as that light bulb's light is caught in that bullseye, it appears to be a flash, although that light bulb is on at all times. It's an amazing technology. And this was um, 
one that you're seeing it, the light, what it looks like in the lens room itself. Now we go back to our original map and where Little Booster Island is and all the green. The green is now the um, National Park Service. It's the 470th park that was established by the Park Service. It is Boston Harbor Islands National and State Park. Everything that is green is part of that partnership, including Little Brewster Island. So the, the Coast Guard is one of the partners. And the Park Service brings or brought visitors out to the island 16 weeks during the summer on Friday, Saturdays, and Sundays, two trips a day. However, we are not having any right now, and we'll tell that story later. That at some point in time, it will be reopened to, um, to visitors. And then we had another chain. Remember, we started with civilian keepers from 1716 to 1939, and then it's been military out there until 2003 when the Coast Guard realized they need those law, en law enforcement personnel for uh, home homeland security. After 9-11, it changed the way the Coast Guard functioned. It went from the Department of Transportation to the Department of Homeland Security. And this is when I got hired. Uh, Jay, my husband and I we were volunteering out there since 1994. Had no idea that I was gonna end up the keeper of Boston Light. Prior to that, I was a college professor. How do you go college, college professor to a lighthouse keeper? I still scratch my head on that one. We have no public access to Boston Light for a number of reasons. One of the most significant one is in 2018, we had severe, severe storms. And um, I'm missing something here, okay? Um, so when um, we had the storms, there was damage and we don't have portable water, potable water out there anymore. The place is not livable. Jay and I used to live out there five and a half months a year for 15 years and um, not doing that anymore. So how do we get to the island? <laughs> Jay was just wiping his tears from his face if you were wondering what he was doing. So what, this was the island before the storms. Oops, where did the storm pictures go to? Oh well, getting to the island. So when we went out to the island yesterday, um, this was about the height of the tide when we went and needed to climb up the ladder up to the island. And this is an example of what the Coast Guard does when they come out to maintain the light and the sound signal. Ah, here are the storms. So we have a beautiful clear day and that can go sour at any time. <laughs> and this was a severe storm that we had out of Boston Light when I was actually out there. And uh, it was because of this storm that it was determined that I couldn't live out there year round, that I had to come off the island during the winter. And this was a storm in, um, in um, 2018 that totally destroyed the wooden walkway and stones everywhere. We lost some island during that storm. There were three of them in a row, erosion, and we spent a lot of time, these are Coast Guard auxiliaries, civilian attire, helping to move the stones off the, off the grass, putting them back where they came and doing repairs on the boathouse. And um, we have um, the cistern building and the big roof is the way that we collected the water we never drank the water from this. This is what was used back in 1884 for the fog signal steam engine. But we could use it for taking showers, doing laundry, watering the grass, things like that. So we could have a very beautiful island. The way we got our water was we bring it out in five gallon jugs. And what do we do out at the island? We have expected ones. We know we're gonna get visited by the kayakers. We just don't know when. The Coast Guard holds ceremonies out there. We get visited by Flying Santa that lands the helo on the island. We have the news people. We had AccuWeather out there. <laughs> we had a whale that had that died out in the ocean. We end on the beach, and here we have 
the um, aquarium researches um, measuring the, the woman that was a female one. And then we had bones that washed up on the island. And we can't finish, we can't have a lighthouse story without our dog. Sammy the lighthouse dog was the first, uh, the last official Coast Guard lighthouse dog in the country and he's buried on the island, that Sammy. In 21st century, do we still need aids to navigation? Do we still need Boston Light? This is amazing. People still go aground between Little Rooster and Great Rooster Island. And what we have now, for, uh, when we lose our power from Hull, uh, we have this small um, solar yeah. system that runs backup lights at the top of the tower, as well as it can um, activate the fog signal when mariners key into their marine radio. This is what the canisters look like that give that beep every 30 seconds. And this is the backup light. There are LED lights. There's one on one side of the tower and one on the other because it's round, it's obstructed. It reduces the visibility of the light from 27 miles down to seven miles. And this is what the lights look like at night when the top of the tower, when the big light is not operable. And um, this is me bringing, uh, striking the colors at sunset for a photo op. And this is Boston light during a snowstorm. And that's it. Thank you. Well, that was just wonderful, Sally. You covered so much. Um, and I want to encourage our audience to, again, to use the Q&A feature uh, to ask your questions. But, but let me begin. I'm curious, you talked about the time when, when the two of you would be out there for five and a half months. Can you describe what, if there was such a thing, what a typical day would have been like? Like when you got up in the morning, what you did and you know how late you were up, like what the whole day was like? Well, the work day started at, um, at 6.45 in the morning. And we go out and we walk the island, we climb the tower, we check to see if there was any, um, anything that arrived, up, arrived on the island during the night, making sure that everything is in order. And then we have our breakfast. And because we get on island time, we have a work list of things that need to be done during a watch. And because I was out there all the time, except occasionally coming home, Jay would be the one that would come home, get the mail, things like that. Um, and it, we would have a Sunday to Wednesday and Wednesday to Sunday. And we'd have a list of what needed to get done during those watches. And then the one from Wednesday to Sunday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday were tour days. So no maintenance got done there. We would just prepare for the tours in the morning and close things up when I left late afternoon and, and that was our day. And because we were visiting, we could um, give tours to what we call the drive-bys, so that had kayaks and things like that. It was a long day for us, quarter of six in the morning until um, you know the sun goes down. We mow the lawn, we repair like the front steps needed repairs. Anything that you do on the mainland, that's what we do out on the island. The difference is, is if we run out of paint or sandpaper or toilet paper, uh, we just can't get in that car and go to the store. And the volunteers that came out to stand watches, what they didn't bring, they didn't have. So they had to plan what they needed for their food, what they wanted to do for entertainment, bring magazines or game boards, whatever they wanted to do. So we worked until sunrise to sunset. So in the summertime, I would be still like mowing the lawn at eight o'clock at night, uh, if need be. And um, that's what we did. Yeah. The other thing we traditionally did was the weather every three hours. During the daylight hours, we, we monitored weather and um, reported it to NOAA, the National Oceanic Bureau Administration. So you were really a weather station as well? Yes. Okay, so question about how the light gets kept clean, all those, those pieces of glass. Is there a process that you had to take care of? Uh, yes. Um, when we had tours in the summertime, as the visitors climbed the tower and went back down, it would turn up a, you know, like a lot of dust. And we would need to clean that on a weekly basis. 
where we don't have that happening now, we only need to do it every couple of months. And it's, um, it's white vinegar, distilled water, and just a little drop of woolite um, on a, um, a dustless uh, cloth that we use. And we do it very, very carefully. We don't put any pressure on those 336 presents. It's very, very light. Oh. Um, so an uh, interesting question um, about the, the signal that the light gives off. Now you made, made the point that the light stays on all the time, but because it's turning, it gives that impression that it's going on and off. And, and it's a, like a flash every 10 seconds. But um, Minot Light, it's famous for its I love you, 143. Are there uh, intentional different signals for different lighthouses? Absolutely. If you noticed all the different configurations of lighthouse towers, and the tower is what we call a day mark, so that there's no tower that looks exactly like Boston Light. It looks similar, like Portland Light looks similar to ours, but they don't have the, the, the two decks at the top that we have. And um, so the light flash is different too. So during the daytime, the, the building itself, it tells the mariner what lighthouse they're looking at. And at night, it, the light tells them. Uh, the Graves light gives two flashes every 12 seconds. Boston light, once every 10 seconds. And Milet's light, as we know, the I love you, uh, I, oh, one, four, three. Yeah. Question, how is the lighthouse operation funded? What is the Coast Guard. So it's tax taxpayer money, basically. The taxpayers, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, how how's the lighthouse heated, or the keeper's house heated when you were out, able to live out there? What what's the source of heat? Uh, we have a thirteen thousand foot extension cord from Windmill Point in Hull that uh, goes underwater across Nantasket Roads out to the light. And we used to have a, um, a furnace with uh, diesel fuel. However, that's a whole story into itself. And that was not doable anymore. So we have uh, um, the space heaters. So with electric space heaters, I individual rooms have their each, each radiator. The question, is there hope that tours will resume at some point? Uh, you talked about the damage from the storms and then also the pandemic obviously was a factor, but do you, is there some uh, desire to restart tours by the coast? A absolutely. And because it's part of the Boston Harbor Islands and National State Park that was established in 1996, there's a congressional law that says that Boston Light does have to have public access. So yes, it's got to be open. And I'm going to share something else with you and Jay's just going to get his hanky out again. The well, Coast Guard is in the process of divesting lighthouses all around the country. And the question was, was Boston Light going to be one of the divestures? Because the lighthouses are old and they require a lot of TLC and a lot of financing. And the Coast Guard is into aids to navigation, the flashing light and the fog signal. They're not structural engineers, historians of how to keep these structures maintained. So they are in the process now of looking for a new owner for Boston Light. Until that happens, uh, the Coast Guard will continue maintaining Boston Light. I will remain on the Coast Guard payroll and uh, the stewardship transfer is one that the federal government has the opportunity to have what we call first dibs at it. It can go to another agency, federal agency. And then it could be offered to the state or a municipality. And then if that doesn't happen, it can go to a 501c3. For, uh, and then if that doesn't happen, it can go for auction, like mine, it's in Gray's Light. But because Boston Light is so significant and it's part of the national park, it's one of the, the players in that, um, we're just, we're in the process of seeing who, who would be willing to maintain this beautiful, iconic national maritime piece of history. So, uh, so however that plays out, yes. the ultimate buyer would need to, need to maintain the light 
Yes. Well, no, the Coast Guard will maintain the light bulb at the top okay. and the fog signal. And whoever owns it, whether it be federal or state, you know, whoever gets it, they would be maintaining the island where the Coast Guard has been doing it. They would take over that responsibility and they'd have to have it open to the public for, uh, you know, at least minimally, like we were doing Friday, Saturdays and Sundays. Okay. And because it's in the outer harbor, it's a catch as catch can. Um, you to go out there, <laughs> it can be a lot rougher out there than it can be inland. So when the tours were, were um, did happen, there was about a quarter of them that were canceled during the season. So uh, one of our observant audience members uh, wants to ask about the stamp that's on the wall behind you and what's the story behind Boston Light. Uh, getting a forever stamp. In uh, <laughs> um, the U.S. Postal Service, uh, uh, for a number of years, wanted representatives of lighthouses around the country. So they broke it up into con into um, into sections. And the last one to be done was the Northeast. And they chose from whatever area they were. They took five lighthouses. And for New England, Boston Light was one of them, Portland Light, um, there was one from each state. And it turned out that Boston Light was the premier one. So when the stamps were issued in um, July of 2013, that's when they went out for sale, uh, they, it was Boston Light that was the premier and we had a grand thing at the Greenway in Boston by the National Park Service um, visitor booth there. And it just so happened that one of our assistant light keepers was a postmaster and pushed to take and get it through. <laughs> so you know, know somebody, yeah. Yeah, so um, I kept the poster that was on display at the Greenway in Boston. <laughs> so uh, someone in the audience asked about the strength of the light that in her uh, experience out on the harbor, it seems that the sweep of the light is not as it's not as strong, doesn't go as far as it used to. Now, you talked about the alternative lights when the, the main light is, is out of function. So maybe that's that because that does have a different strength. But has something changed in the um, in the in the nature of the light that makes it reach not as far as it used to? Or is it just the odds that maybe the main light was out and the smaller I think light. it's more atmospheric conditions. Ah, okay. The atmospheric conditions have a whole lot to do with it. Okay. But that 1,000 watt lamp is, it's still a 1,000 watt lamp. It hasn't changed to a lesser uh, power. So that theoretically, the ray should be going that same 27 miles, nautical miles. Okay. Um, question about whether lighthouse keepers, because uh, this is part of the treasury service at some point, did they ever play a role in monitoring illegal shipments of liquor uh, during prohibition or, or maybe even earlier on in history, uh, monitoring illegal shipments uh, coming in? Would a lighthouse keeper have had a role like that? Well, during that time, it was with the Department of Commerce which was very <laughs> much concerned about the, uh, of what was happening with the liquor runs. And yes, Boston Harbor was extraordinarily busy um, with that. With, and as far as what the keeper's job was for that, um, no, they didn't have any particular duty. They just made sure that the lights and the fog signal was working. Okay. Uh, someone asked, do you know how much it cost to move Sand Key Light on Nantucket in the early part of the century. Some mm, idea of the range. No, have no idea. <laughs> okay. Uh, another question: Is Boston Light the last remaining manned or non-automated lighthouse, uh, based on the legislation from Senator Ted Kennedy? Um. What um. It, it was automated. Um, in 1948. And was it at the time that it was automated? Had it been the last man? No, it's, it's, um, it has 98, been. Not 48. 1998 huh? went into automation. The light was automated, so you didn't have okay. to Okay, um, correction. 
1948, it was electrified. Okay. And so that it was rotating by electricity as opposed to the hand cranking that they were doing. Right. Um, and then for automated where it no longer needed uh, keepers on the island anymore, that was in 1998. And so and at, that, it, at that point, was it the last one to convert to automation? You yes, know? yes. And the reason why there's a keeper out of Boston Light is because of um, Senator Kennedy's 1989 legislation. Okay. Uh, question, does the foghorn still operate? And if yes, has the frequency or the volume changed? You were talking about the, the mariners control it now. Is that still the case? Yes, um, the fog signal is done on VHF um, marine radio channel 83 alpha. So if any mariners are listening, listening to this, that's the frequency that you want to go on. And the, the sound level is the same, that it hasn't been reduced. It's the difference is that it's not being activated by um, mechanically. I mean, it was a device in our generator room that monitored and it would keep that signal going. Now it's it rests until it gets activated by radio. Okay. Uh, the sound question. signal is less now than it may have been in the 50s and 60s. And part of that's to keep the neighbors happy. It's really as needed because you're saying the mariners basically uh, start, it, start it and stop it. Um, another question, are there protocols in place for emergencies? Now the, the questioner didn't, specify what kind of emergency, but you now imagining if you had to evacuate the island when you were still living out there five and a half months, what kind of emergency procedures did you have to drill or? Um, well, it's interesting that the picture that I showed you with the waves going over the pier, um, that was the last winter that I spent out there because what the Coast Guard realized is that they couldn't have got myself and the person that I was on watch with off the island. And um, short of getting a helo up there to take us off, but even then, it turned out to be, it was just it was supposed to be a blizzard in a turn, um, uh, a nor'easter, and it turned into a full blown blizzard, a uh, hurricane in the wintertime. Mm. And um, uh, she and I had a ball out there. We were just running from window to window in the keeper's house taking pictures and go, oh, look at this wave, oh, look at this wave. <laughs> um, but it was, it was a hazard and that's why we don't do winters anymore. And even now when we go out there, it's all, we have to watch the weather very, very carefully. And um, we go out for like day duty out there. And sometimes we just can't go out there or we go out to hell gut and it's just not smooth enough for our little boat to go out there. And we turn around and come back. Also, if there is an incident out there, mm -hmm. instead of calling 911, we call the Coast Guard and they determine what resource to use. Yeah. Yeah. And because um, I joke that the reason why I got hired by the Coast Guard Auxiliary, I um, uh, got hired in 2003, because Jay and I are in the Coast Guard Auxiliary and we have, we have a boat and we offer it to the Coast Guard and they reimburse us for fuel. And so um, we get ourselves out there back and forth. And they always know when we're underway. We always know whether we're back at Turin Harbor or right on the island with the boat. And then when we're on um, the island, we need to keep a log of what we do throughout the entire day. And um, there was a little rule that we call them at sunrise and we call them at sunset to let them know that we, that we made it through the night. And we had not only our cell phone out of the island, but we also had the VHF radio that we could communicate with them. So just as a final question, um, I'm curious about uh, little Sally Snowman. <laughs> when you were young, Sally, was there anything in the things you were interested in or your determination or bravery or something that led you to, to this path? Uh, because it's a fascinating one. Uh, and what, what do you think was, uh, you know, if you could go back and be little, little Sally, uh, were you dreaming about a life at sea? Well, um, my family were, we boated, that's what we did. 
um, from Memorial Day until Columbus Day. When we had nothing on the mainland to do, we'd be out on the boat. And when I was 10 years old, my dad brought me out to Boston Light. We anchored the boat, rowed into the beach, and I stepped off from the beach and I looked up at the light and said, Daddy, when I grow up, I want to get married out here. I fell in love with the place. Oh. So yeah, so when we were on the boat and we saw it, I'm like, oh, I love that lighthouse. But once I actually got there and, and like stood up and, and looked up at it and, you know, I'm like, oh my gosh, I wonder if I could ever be the keeper out here someday. And I did. And wow. I, I met Jay in the Coast Guard Auxiliary. We got married out there, and then we started volunteering out there. And the book we wrote was five years of research for Boston Light that we published in 1999. And since I've got hired, people have come out of the woodwork all over the world wanting to interview the keeper. We were looking for information about the light because <laughs> we weren't at anybody. They weren't sharing the information with us. So I thought it's funny how it turns out. Yeah. So, well, actually, another last question, a question that just came in. What is your maritime base? Is it Churn Harbor, Hall Gut? You know, what, what is your base of operation? Um, we you know? keep our boat at Churn Harbor. At Churn Harbor, okay. Well, thank you so much, Sally and Ruth, as well, for giving us such an appreciation of the human challenges, the political complexity involved in overseeing lighthouses so long ago, 18th, 19th centuries, um, and in shedding light, no pun intended, on all the changes <laughs> over time in and around Boston Light on Little Brewster Island. Also, thank you to our wonderful audience, sizable audience today, uh, and many of you have joined us throughout the Benjamin Lincoln's World series, which concludes with this fabulous program. We so appreciate the willingness of the audience to go virtual with us, a whole new experience for the Hingham Historical Society. Uh, and uh, just, it's been uh, a, a terrific journey with you. Uh, so, so thank you for that. Uh, we are now considering uh, how we will uh, uh, host our lecture series for 21-22. So a new series will begin next fall. Um, you'll be getting, those of you who have subscribed or, or bought tickets to a few programs will be getting an email with a questionnaire um, asking you about your preferences. Uh, we're, we're exploring the idea of doing hybrid where there's some in person, but also continuing with Zoom. So we're very interested in hearing what the audience has to say about that. The Education Committee, of which Ruth and I are a part, is well into planning the programs for the next series. And the intriguing title uh, that we have for it is Out of the Box, uh, which does, for us, define what we have in mind. But we will tell you more about that in the brochure that you'll be getting in the mail in early September. So uh, for now, I want to in invite all of you who, during this, this program today, have received an invitation to uh, our separate Zoom for the audience uh, after the program. Uh, so happy to, to see you there. Continue to talk about today's program or the series, uh, or maybe you might get some hints from us about the next series coming up. Uh, but Sally and Jay as well, thank you so much. And Ruth, uh, you know, I love the story about your dad. So touching. Uh, you know, Sally talked about, you know, her little, her little self growing into the light keeper. And here you have this inspiration from your dad and his paper, just, just wonderful. Uh, so, so thank you all for a great program. Look forward to seeing as many of the audience who wants to join us on the Zoom to follow. And Deidre, anything you want to say before we move on to our next Zoom? No, I just, again, I echo your thanks, Eileen. It was a tremendous series and it was so lovely to see so many of you online with us today and staying through the program, Sally. and. Jay, thank you so much. I've moved to the kitchen of the Benjamin Lincoln House. So, um, it, and as I sit in the quiet of this home, I'm just so grateful to all of you for helping enlighten our community and deepen our understanding of the families that lived in this home and their impact on colonial New England. And Sally, you're a big part of that. So thank you. Yes. All right, well, with that, we will leave you for, for the season and look forward to seeing you again in the fall in whatever form that may take. Uh, but in the meanwhile, we'll see you on the, on the post-party Zoom. Uh, so tune in shortly. Thank you all. Mm -hmm.